Hello and welcome to TED Med's live event focusing this great challenge chat on the future of personalized medicine. I'm Greg Masters and I'll be moderating today's discussion which will run about an hour. This session is part of the Great Challenges program sponsored by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Big kudos out to RJF. Um, Robert Wood Johnson. The goal of the Great Challenges program is to look at 20 of the most complex problems in health and medicine, issues that can't be solved with a magic bullet or even one-shot cure or perhaps policy. Our mission is not to solve these issues but to share ideas from many disciplines to reach a better if not holistic understanding than what we had before. We'll be taking questions from viewers on Google Hangout and on Facebook as well as Twitter and that's at TedMed on Twitter. Just tag, tag your questions with hash or pound symbol great challenges. That's plural and we'll try to get to them. As mentioned, my name is Greg Masters. I'm both a student and practitioner of social media and one who believes that the whole is much more than just the sum of its parts. I'm also co-founder and CEO of Zenate Media and founding partner in the Health Innovation Broadcast Consortium. Also know it also known as HIBC.TV, and Ted Med has asked me to moderate today's event. Today we're delighted to welcome a great team of experts who will call our challenge team to lead the discussion on this topic. Ashley Dombrowski is the Chief Business Officer for 23andMe, a group on a mission to be the world's trusted source of personal genetic information. Dr. Amy Miller, PhD, is the Vice President of Public Policy for the Personalized Medicine Coalition, working with innovators, scientists, providers, and payers to reach consensus on policy issues impacting personalized medicine. Dr. Mike, Michael Polini, MD, is the President and Chief Executive Officer at Foundation Medicine, a cancer diagnostics company at the forefront of bringing genomic analysis to routine cancer care. And Amber Trivedi is a senior genetics counselor at Inform DNA, a nationwide network of genetics experts available by telephone to help patients and providers harness the power of genetics to achieve the promise of personalized health care. So welcome everyone. Each day we're closer to an understanding of the roles of genomics. Excuse me, each day we're closer to understanding the role of genomics in the environment in a patient's medical history. Yet translating knowledge into treatment isn't easy, as each patient has a spectacularly unique genetic makeup. So let's start with you, Amy, and a few introductory comments, would you first help us better understand what personalized medicine is and also what it means for both clinicians and patients? Thank you. I like to think of personalized medicine as targeting treatment to those who will benefit sparing exposure and expense of those who will not. Um, sometimes it's thought of in the shorthand as genetic-based medicine, um, but there are also some good examples that I think make it make it more real for people. So for example, taking a test before a drug or being diagnosed with cancer and getting your tumor typed before you embark on any drug regimen. Those are some really good, important, and common examples of personalized medicine. Ashley, how about over to you? Give us your take. So, so I think of personalized medicine as really having two main columns, two main tenants where the first one is really molecular profiling, uh, and then the second one are targeted therapeutics that are really addressing the disease at a molecular level. So, um, so that's molecular, or sorry, that's a personalized medicine, but I do think that in the context of the tools that we have today, we can expand the definition to go beyond personalized medicine to really personalized prevention as well, and I hope that we get a chance to talk about how those two things fit together in these increasingly targeted, genetically um, moderated plans for individuals either to um, you know, um, intervene before disease uh, comes in, but then to foreshorten that disease um, or potentially cure it once it's been diagnosed. 
And I think given that personalized medicine, even at its most effective, will still only be um, palliative more than it's curative, expanding the definition to think of personalized prevention will be really important too. Dr. Polini, you have some thoughts? And Greg, it's hard to argue with what Amy and Ashley said. I, I, I fully agree. And I think maybe a very simplistic way of thinking about personalized or individual medicine is just we're, going, we're, we're basically trying to go from the idea that we need a shotgun to cure disease to looking for that laser beam to cure disease. Because shotguns cause a lot of collateral damage, a laser beam goes straight after the source of the illness. And that's, that's in essence, what we're trying, what we are driving towards. It's the right drug for the right person at the right time. If we do that well, I think we've achieved personalized medicine. Uh, of course, there's a lot more to it, but you know, that's a nice, simple explanation. And Amber, have we heard from you? Um, yes, I definitely agree with any, everything everyone else has said so far. Um, as a practicing genetic counselor, uh, we deal much of the time with, with what Ashley had mentioned and really using personalized medicine for the power of prevention. And I would also say another layer from the genetic counselor's uh, viewpoint is really empowering the patient to be involved in their own health care where they can see how uh, medicine and management recommendations might affect them personally and how that affects not only their health, but also their lifestyle, their preferences, and uh, allows them to participate with their provider in their health care. Great. Thanks, everybody. Welcome. Uh, fabulous opening here. So let's take some of these questions that have been submitted. This is uh, received from a Facebook user, Stephanie Sims, Uland. And I'll read, 15 years ago, I was one of hundreds of biologists working on the Human Genome Project. Ten years later, a happy feeling came over me when I learned that the genomic test that determined my cancer was slow growing and that chemotherapy could le be left out of my treatment plan, partially based on the information from my toil. Yeah, personalized medicine made a big difference in my life. Michael, you must have several examples of this in your work with Foundation Medicine. How is, it, how is personalized medicine integrating in cancer care and treatment? You know, even before I answer the, the final uh, question, Greg, I think uh, thinking back 15 years ago, uh, I was in the exact same position uh, working with a small company in Cambridge, Massachusetts, trying to take the information coming out of the Human Genome Project and apply it to cl clinical practice. Uh, we thought, I think at the time, we thought that um, we'd be able to use this information for both diagnostic and therapy, diagnostic testing and, uh, and treatment uh, within several years. And of, co of course, it's taken a lot longer to play out. But one of the most gratifying things to me personally is to really see the development of this work over the course of 15 years. And, um, and fortunately for my position at Foundation Medicine, we do in fact get to see the impact of this approach almost every single day. We received uh, tissue specimens from patients with cancer literally all over the world. And we take that information and we try to understand each patient's cancer at the level of its molecular blueprint. That information is then provided to physicians so that they can select therapeutics that are actually targeting the key genetic drivers within each patient's cancer. And uh, while not every case is, uh, you know, is, is, uh, has a successful outcome, um, what we've been looking at for the past year really does give us a strong sense of the future of this field. Uh, then you can jump to other fields such as uh, you know, HIV and, and we've seen the benefits of personalized medicine there, tremendous advances in cystic fibrosis and, and the list goes on, we're, but we're certainly at the tip of the iceberg. And Greg, Greg Heath, any thoughts? Yeah, I just um, I wanted to say I think you know personalized medicine is a lot about optimizing therapies and just to build on what Mike was saying earlier, um, we do some whole genome sequencing here and we see um, uh, big impacts uh, both in the end stage cancer care cases and also in pediatric genetic cases where people are often on a diagnostic odyssey, they might get a gene sequenced, they're really not sure what their disease is, they get another gene sequenced and they go, go on and on getting bounced from uh, specialist to specialist. By doing whole genome sequencing, it allows people to kind of explore alternatives in silico and come up with the optimal therapies. And I think that's exactly what Mike and his team are doing as well. Yeah. Ashley, earlier on Twitter from at Rhonda Wild, I got this question she, or statement. She says, I think of my personal healthcare roadmap 
to stay healthy that is monitored and an engaged physician to help me navigate it. How is the genomics data, the reporting, uh, influencing or, or uh, feeding back to engagement at the level of physician and treatment plans and so forth? So that's a great question. I think one of the uh, most important things about an individual, uh, a consumer, or a patient as consumer accessing their own data is that they're able to bring that data to a physician um, and, and really add that to the conversation when a care plan is being put into place. So we have um, story after story of individuals who, um, enabled by this deeper insight into their genomes, are able to bring that information to the physician and then, uh, you know, um, really optimize something about their care plan. So, you know, the example of the, the executive who comes in to his physician in advance of his stenting to bring the information to the physician's attention that um, he has genetic factors that indicate an, a non-responsiveness to Plavix. So in advance of the angioplasty, being able to talk to the physician about that and then have the physician incorporate that into um, the, the prescribed uh, medications post-procedure have a better um, shot at tailoring the therapy to really prevent, um, you know, the, the unwanted, um, you know, uh, heart issues um, that could, could come up after that procedure. So I think that it's that back and forth dialogue um, enabled by um, both the, the genetic knowledge and literacy of a patient and the physician being um, interested and educated enough to, to, to bring that into the, um, to the conversation. Amber, coming to you, this is a, a mashup of both a Twitter and Facebook question, but uh, from Twitter, Kyle asks, do you see genome sequencing as a possible surrogate to devices such as 23andMe to achieve personalized medicine? And the other question is, uh, will this data become a tsunami that overwhelms clinicians and patients and be problematic in terms of adding value to, to the lives of doctors and patients. I think I'll go ahead and tackle the second part of that question first because I do think that is one of the major concerns and how big data really will be implemented in EHRs and digested by clinicians and patients and it is very true. It is a lot of data to keep track of. Uh, one of the factors or practices uh, some laboratories and practices might be considering is just keeping track of the abnormal variants or unknown variants of significance um, to track those but not uh, keeping all of the data just because it is requiring large amounts of storage. Um, regarding whether whole genome sequencing would be a surrogate to 23andMe, I do think they are different entities. Uh, what 23andMe has done has taken some of the better known aspects of the genome and digested it into very interpretable, for, interpretable format. Uh, whereas whole genome sequencing is still the wild west of uh, genetics right now. Uh, there is a lot of work going on in interpretation uh, and we're still at the tip of the iceberg in what we can offer as far as interpretation of those whole genomes. So there's still a long way to go before that becomes digestible as well. Now, Amy, I've got a little question from you. I'm going to pull it out of the book, uh, The Creative Destruction of Medicine by Dr. Eric Topol. Get your context on it. It reads as follows. Doctors prescribe medicine of which they know little to cure diseases of which they know less in human beings of which they know nothing. And that was Francois-Marie Arouet Voltaire about 250 years ago. How are we doing today? I think that there has been a revolution in healthcare, and it is our own ownership of our own healthcare. So, to bridge the previous question to this one, part of what's going to help us understand the tsunami is that we ourselves are going to own our own healthcare. We're going to be deeper investigators into how we can control our own health and how we can manage our own disease. And so, while that statement, unfortunately, has a lot of current resonance. I do think that there has been a change in that we now have more access to information than we ever have before. Now we expect it, and now we're going to use it. And I think personalized medicine will help us get there. Great. Got a follow-up here from Twitter. Over to Dr. Polini. How about uh, from Nick on Twitter? With informed patients through quantified self, labs, data, etc., 
what changes are we likely to see in doctor-patient relationships? Nick can't hear you. Are you mute? Excuse me. I've got it. So I said it's, it's a great it's a great question and certainly one where uh, I'm sure every every panelist will ha will have a viewpoint. But you know the world is changing. Uh, it's not just the world outside of medicine, but the world inside of medicine is changing. And I think the relationships between uh, physicians and their patients are going to change. If uh, if physicians don't elect the change, um, patients are going to force them to change. And I think going back to the data question, because it all comes down to data. It's not just the phys it's not just what the physician, what the nurse practitioner, um, uh, what the physician assistant learned in medical training. It's about what do we have access? What does the medical? What does the the what does the medical profession have access to each and every day over the internet? We see new peer-reviewed articles that come out not just once a month, not just once a week, but every hour if we elect to go to the internet and pull down this information. And guess what? Patients see the exact same thing. So they come in armed to have these conversations. And so one thing's for sure, I know that patients are going to continue to drive a transformation of healthcare. But at the same time, I'm really optimistic as I see more and more uh, physicians adopting uh, and implementing these uh, these these new techniques for especially for genomic testing there's tremendous pull in the marketplace uh, for these types of services and the pull is not just coming from patients it's actually coming from physicians and that tells me that we're not all the way there but there are there's a there's a key and important subset of physicians today uh, that are willing to adopt new technologies and are, and are and actually want patients to come in armed with this type of information and these questions. I'm, I'm extremely optimistic based on what I've seen over the past year or two. So while you're in that zone, Mike, here's follow-up. Will consumers diagnosed with cancer ask for a deep dive sequencing of their tumor? Uh, it's, it's not a question of the future, it's a question of the past. Yes, they are already doing that. Um, you know, if we go back to uh, uh, you know to the uh, the history of Steve Jobs and and read his book, and you know, just two or three years ago, this was something that only the privileged had access to. Now, thanks to the work of uh, whether it's with, you know groups of like Greg's company, Illumina, uh, 23andMe, Foundation Medicine, uh, Personalized Medicine Coalition, we're all pushing this information out, um, and and you know, it's again, it's a question of the past, patients physicians already have access to this type of information. The next question is, now that we're able to generate the information in such a sensitive and specific, so therefore very accurate way, you know, are, are there enough therapeutics out there to really act on the information? And that's what we're, we're, we're waiting on. We've seen tremendous progress on the therapeutic side over the past couple of years. That world is also changing with the, with the advent of this, uh, this whole genomics uh, revolution. But we're all dependent on the drug companies to produce the appropriate therapeutics so we can really uh, stamp out some of these diseases for the long term. Indeed, Greg, uh, over to you. Tell us a little bit about Illumina and its role in this process. Sure. So Illumina makes uh, high-density microarrays and next-gen sequencing instruments and reagents. And those tools are being used both on the research front to help shape the science as well as on the, um, on the clinical practice front. So I, I think it's um, very much aligned with what Mike described. I think it's happening today. Um, there is a lot of information generated, but how much of it is actionable is dependent upon the therapies that are available today. Uh, FDA seems to be cranking out on average about 28 new compounds across the board, uh, including cancer, per year. So that's what gets approved. Now there are lots of things in the pipeline. There's lots of experimental choices that people can use, but it's really optimizing that portfolio today. I think in the not too distant future, we're going to see this explosion result in a lot of new medications that are going to make life a lot easier for patients. Um, and you know, I think the arguments that I hear oftentimes are, well, you're generating a lot of information that we don't know what to do with. But that's that's true for almost every area of medicine. If you if you do a MRI, you get a lot of information that we don't know what to do with today. But clinicians are very adept at handling. I think those massive amounts of information and triaging what's important for the patient in front of them today. So, um, so I see the information overload as a little bit less of a burden and actually a benefit to the scientific community as they move forward with better therapeutic options. Ashley Dombrowski 
can you talk about the pros and cons of the uh, consumerization of medicine? Yeah, sure. Uh, building on a couple of things that have been said, I think one of the interesting things about the consumerization of healthcare, and one of the things that we hear a lot uh, about, is that you know, as we said, you know, patients are more educated; they're intolerant of these uh, information asymmetries of the past. They're adamant that they own their own data and should have access to it. Uh, they want providers to keep perfect pace with this expanding deluge of research. They want their physicians responsive in real time. And all of those things um, you know, are raised often as you know, concerns about how things are, are changing, or rather observations about how things are changing. But I think the flip side that's really exciting is that the consumer as patient, or the patient as consumer, is increasingly engaged and collaborative. And that can be harnessed to do things like uh, accelerate the development of novel therapies, let researchers understand the true value or limitations of a therapeutic when it's used in a real-world setting under real-world conditions. Uh, they can communicate to their physicians, help make connections between health history, behaviors, symptoms, genetics to help improve diagnoses and care. And I think one of the reasons that we have seen oncology really take off in this personalized medicine paradigm is that not only do profiling technologies exist, um, target therapies, well, we need more. They, there are some, but there are sophisticated care networks that really know how to coordinate therapy at a molecular level. There's evidence that personalized medicine can actually deliver more value than it costs, and the patients are demanding this level of care. And that sort of gives us some insights, I think, into what the, the opportunity is in other therapeutic areas or what the factors are um, in a convergence that can lead to an area really taking off in this, in this um, new framework. Amber, let me ask you, um, with perhaps the closest uh, sense of the on-the-ground experience here, how, how does this become actionable data as you engage with pa uh, patients that inform DNA? Um, yes. Yeah, so essentially we look to see uh, what are the differences between data that um, can give consumers a sense of empowerment and motivation uh, but may not necessarily tell you anything different than what you might already know based on family history versus the data that actually uh, does have evidence basis to change management guidelines on it. And both forms of data can be valuable, uh, obviously, if there is a variant that is clinically proven and studies have shown uh, is associated with a certain outcome and certain management guidelines will improve that outcome, um, that's extremely valuable knowledge for moving uh, medicine forward. Um, in terms of data that we're still learning about, uh, there's still value to that as well. Um, we've been involved in different projects along with 23andMe and looking at how uh, consumers can use this information to motivate them, um, even if it's not something different than what they might have known from their family history, that sense and interpretation of, that's my data, it's intrinsic to me, it's not something that's out there with my other family members, that can still be very motivating in terms of spurring health, healthy behaviors. Great. Thanks for that. Now here's one from Twitter. Uh, Mindy Schwartz Brown asks, what makes a good genome test and how do you engage your local general medicine community in using this tool? Let's start with Ashley. Sorry. Ashley, you're muted. Yes. Uh, so, so I think that, um, you know, Having access to this kind of data is going to be absolutely critical to, to bringing it into, um, into, uh, into a care paradigm. And I think that um, if it's generated by a physician, that's fantastic. Um, but, uh, you know, patients also need to be educated on, on what this is because I, I love the points that have been made um, seconds ago about how someone understanding something about the um, their precise profile uh, actually makes them more compliant, really highlights to them how they are unique and different. And, and I think that um, it, it's one of those can't exist on its own. They have to exist together. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, let me ask Dr. Polini, do you have some thoughts there? I do, I do, and um, I could probably spend an hour on this one, but I won't. So I think it's critical that 
uh, we focus on the accuracy of the test. Uh, if we're running a test that doesn't have the appropriate level of sensitivity and specificity and we're just going to miss the relevant findings, what's the purpose of running the test? And so it really starts, I think, with any good approach, any good medical approach is, is you know, how good is the, is the tool that you're using? Um, that's the starting point. The second piece to consider is are we just generating information for the, sec for the sake of it? And uh, what you've already heard a few times mentioned is this notion of actionable information. What's the point in generating information, even if it is highly accurate, if we really can't do anything with it? Now, if I'm a pharmaceutical company or a biotech or I'm working in my research lab and I'm doing research, absolutely, I want that information. I want the broad-based information. But if I'm a physician, if I'm a patient, uh, et cetera, or somebody participating in the, uh, in the care of a patient, I really want to focus on the clinically relevant findings. And clinically rele relevant means that I can take this information, whether it's in a preventive fashion or it's in a sense like uh, in a way that Foundation Medicine uh, works with, with uh, oncologists as we think about uh, patients with cancer, to apply the appropriate therapeutic. And so it has to be accurate, number one, and number two, the information should be actionable. And that's a great starting point. Dr. Miller, do you have some thoughts? You're muted. Perhaps. Yes, I do. Thank you. Um, I would agree with the others that we do need actionable information, but I'd like to talk a little bit about personal utility. Some of us don't have a very deep personal family health history. We may not know one of our parents or either of them. They may have died young or we may come from a very small family. And so in addition to actionability, I think that a good genetic test or a good personalized medicine test might also offer up personal utility or um, the ability to use the information for one's own uses. And I think that's an important factor to remember when we're talking about personalized medicine. And to close this out, Amber, do you have anything to add? Um, yes, I do think it's uh, confusing at times for people who certainly don't have a family history. They might be adopted or it's uninformative, they're estranged and don't know uh, their family history. And so personalized medicine and genetic testing can inform on that, but I do think it is difficult from a public health standpoint to identify um, where we draw the line uh, with what is recommended for a general population versus what may be extremely useful on an individual basis. And I think that is one of the larger barriers um, to seeing personalized medicine expand is we're still defining what those uh, boundaries are, uh, what can be applied to the public health standpoint versus what has been successful for individuals. Thanks for that. Greg Heath, here's a micro uh, deep dive question for you from Trisha on Twitter. How do you see DNA microarray technology evolving beyond research and development apps? Yeah, so we're seeing a lot of uh, good applications with uh, microarrays and uh, one of the probably ones at the forefront right now is cytogenetics. So cytogenetics is used for diagnosing a number of things, including some uh, cancer cases, but also a, um, uh, developmental delay, mental retardation, and autism. Uh, it's also used prenatally to analyze uh, amniocentesis samples. And essentially what you're looking at are chromosomal changes or rearrangements. Uh, but a microarray allows you to get a whole genome view but also um, uh, get the sensitivity and specificity of something like a fish assay, which is um, you know, a, a probe that's used for specific targets. Um, so you really kind of get the best of both worlds. Illumina has submitted um, a microarray for cytogenetics to the FDA um, just, just recently, just this quarter, and we're, um, you know, we're going to try to move forward with that in the, in the clinical context. So, um, microarrays, I think, are going to coexist alongside of sequencing. Uh, sequencing does give you much higher resolution. The cost points are still a little bit different, but in, in the long run, if you're looking for high resolution, you can move to, um, to a sequencing-based uh, assay in the future. Um, you know, I, I think also it's interesting because these technologies often give birth to um, new applications, and, and one on the sequencing side is um, looking at uh, prenatal testing. So 
uh, in the past you would get um, uh, a first trimester test that might indicate a problem you might go on to get amniocentesis but amniocentesis carries a slight risk uh, uh, with it through the procedure what you can do with sequencing is you can take uh, cell free DNA from a maternal blood draw so you're just taking a you know a syringe of blood like you like you would normally for uh, for any tests like cholesterol test you sequence all the free DNA in there and you can reveal whether or not there's aneuploidies uh, in the fetus so it's it's an improvement in medicine that I think um, you weren't able to do previously and it's enabled by the technology okay thanks for that let's go back to an earlier question and uh, uh, from Facebook from Tom Imbrex I don't know if I have that correct and uh, this is also tagged in a follow-up Twitter question we should not forget the patient all this medical evolution is hiding the person behind his or her genome environment and disease a personalized treatment needs to focus on more than that what does my patients want what are their needs what can he or she carry that should be the basis of our approach as health workers when we have figured that out or we can put our machinery to work it's not up to us to decide what's best we only have possibilities Dr. Polini you want to take that well it's um, uh, it is all about the patient so it's uh, you know it's why we get up out of bed every morning it's why if you're involved in this industry you work a ridiculous number of hours uh, it's just the nature of, of what we do every single day and uh, while I think sometimes we get lost in, in the technology sometimes we get lost in the challenges around reimbursement and dealing with payers and sometimes we get lost in the data um, you know, an easy thing that, that, that um, should you know, one of the things that, that we can do and we each have our different vantage points here is if I'm having a bad day I simply have to walk downstairs into our laboratory and uh, look at a bunch of tissue samples that are uh, uh, that are various process and, and various stages being processed and recognize that you know every single one of those tissue samples represents a, a patient with um, a fairly devastating disease because if it was a simple cancer that would be cured by surgical resection or maybe by some simple uh, relatively straightforward therapy that sam that specimen wouldn't arrive at our laboratory or at our company in Cambridge Massachusetts so um, you know there are reminders out there every single day that it is in fact about the patient and uh, while I think we all trip sometimes and forget about that because we get stuck on, on the business of medicine and all the other things uh, you know there are great patient advocacy groups out there we spent a tremendous amount of time a couple of months ago we invited uh, 10 of the top patient ab advocacy groups in the country and spent a day and a half at our company in, in Cambridge at Foundation Medicine just trying to make sure that we really do understand these these issues not just from the physicians perspective and you know, not just from the investors perspective but really from the patients perspective and um, just a great reminder and but there are plenty of reminders if we just take the time to look for those reminders um, uh, you know we won't forget about the patient how they'll, they'll end up dealing with all this information Amber did you have something to say on this one Yes, and I would say that comment certainly uh, is near and dear to my heart. As a genetic counselor, our training is really to be an advocate for the patient and help them make a very educated and informed decision about their health care. But I will say a lot of the um, hustle and bustle around personalized medicine and being focused on the science really speaks to where we are in the infancy of, of growing in this field um, and that I think there is a, a good amount of focus that needs to be put on the healthcare providers before we can even focus on the patient. Um, there are studies that show fewer than half of uh, healthcare providers self-report confidence in uh, interpreting genetic test results, fewer than a third know what test to order, um, and less than a quarter report knowing um, whether this is covered by insurance and having this discussion with their patients. So there's still a huge learning curve from the healthcare provider standpoint on understanding where genetics fits into medicine. And until we tackle that, the patients are not going to be able to get the handheld care they're used to from the providers um, who really know how to explain other types of conditions, treatments, and therapies for them. Amy, any follow-up? Yes, I just wanted to add that we've noticed when we talk to patients or even um, 
people who know someone who's experienced personalized medicine through a family member, once they've had that experience, I think they're curious as to why it's not available for another disease state or some other challenge they're experiencing. And I think this is part of the mix. So as individuals have an experience with one avenue of personalized medicine, they're going to demand it uh, in others. And I think that will help grow knowledge of personalized medicine and ownership of healthcare, but then also might increase demand on physicians, industry, and payers. And this is from Twitter. Sarah asks, and this is a, as granular as it gets perhaps, she says, you mentioned patients driving this, but I'm in a small community and I don't have cancer. Are there opportunities for me to leverage this data in my health history? How do I even start with this dialogue and with my health team? Ashley, you want to kick this one off? That's a fantastic question. So one of the uh, things that uh, we're able to do with an individual with their genetic profile is let people uh, essentially anywhere from you know, a small town um, you know, to, to big cities to access this data on their own and review it on their own timelines even before they can schedule um, you know, longer appointments um, with, with um, you know, specialists. So w what that means, and, and by the way, to follow up if, if they'd like with genetic counselors, like the folks at uh, Informed DNA, um, we'll talk about the cancer um, example in a second, but um, we have um, examples where an individual um, will you know, be interested in a, a particular um, disease, um, they receive a, a saliva collection kit through the mail at home. It doesn't require a prescription. Um, we've reduced the price. It's only $99 now. They spit in this tube. They send it back through the mail. And in a couple weeks, they get access to all their data, along with updates, no additional cost, that continue to contextualize the, the information that's in that individual's um, in the microarray generated data. Um, and that continues to, to, to grow over time. So but that's just one piece of it. So the real um, you know, um, mission of 23andMe is to have a research platform that can substantially accelerate and improve the pace of research. And to do that, we need to combine the genotype data with outcomes data, with the so-called phenotype data. How has that genome presented in life? So with my particular genetic background, do I have migraines? Have I had cancer? Is there a family history of cancer? Can we connect that information to the genome and then over time see how all of that changes? The great examples of what we've done with this in the case of cancer are two different um, disease registries that we, we recently uh, completed. One in sarcomas, very rare soft tissue cancers, where um, individuals were uh, recruited to, again, join 23andMe to answer sarcoma-specific questions um, just from their home. So in two years, a thousand people came together to participate in research this way. Um, similarly, we launched one in myeloproliferative neoplasms, very rare blood cancers. And in just one year, a thousand patients came together to pool their DNA and to pool um, insights about responsiveness to therapy, progression um, on, on, um, you know, of the disease, and really do more than just um, you know, reading generic um, information on the internet um, and do more than the physician visits. All of that's important too, but we can add to patient education and allow people to contribute to research um, quite, quite effortlessly. Greg Heath, uh, Dr. Chris Kahn on Twitter asks, what do you perceive being the biggest challenge to NGS becoming standard of care in oncology, perhaps starting by defining NGS for the audience? Sure. So NGS is next generation sequencing, and maybe a simple way to think about it is basically it's, it's a high resolution approach to your genome, kind of uh, the ability to look uh, very broadly and very deeply at your your entire genome. Um, you know some of the barriers I think we've articulated a little bit already. I think it's the number of therapies are available that are available today kind of limit the degrees of freedom of of what you can do. So you may know exactly what um, what how to characterize your tumor at the molecular basis, 
but you may not have uh, products available that you can use to treat that tumor. So I think, I think that's one big barrier. Um, secondly, I think we need some regulatory reform. The, the tools and technologies are running um, way out ahead. I mean, uh, sequencing cost, as I think Mike said this earlier, um, is not really the issue. You know, the first genome was sequenced, um, uh, what, about 10 years ago and cost, I think, $3 billion in multiple labs to complete this analysis. Today it can be done in a CLIA lab for anywhere between five and $10,000. So if, you know, just by order of magnitude, if you can imagine the Mars lander that we sent up uh, not too long ago, um, if in 10 years you could launch these from your backyard for five to $10,000, $10, that's, that's the order of magnitude and price decline. So um, that's enabled, uh, I, I think, uh, quite a bit. I don't think that's the right limiting factor. I think we need um, better drugs. I think we need um, better regulatory reform. And, you know, storage used to be an issue for all the data, but I think that's, that's more or less gone away uh, with cloud storage. Um, there's a lot of good information out there. And when you think about it, if sequencing gets cheap enough, uh, DNA is a pretty good storage device itself. Um, there was an article not so long ago that said the entire content of the Internet could be encoded in DNA and represented in basically a test tube. So um, tremendous capacity to store information if sequencing is cheap enough, maybe you become that server, so to speak, and you walk around with the DNA in your cells, which is a pretty good storage tool, and you get sequenced um, on, an, on an ad hoc or as-needed basis. Uh, I think technology's got to be quicker and cheaper to do that, but, um, but it's, it's definitely moving in that direction. So, um, you know, I, I would say probably the biggest barrier in my mind is, um, you know, the availability of, of therapies to act on that for, for cancer and I think also the, um, uh, like I say, a little bit the interpretation, uh, letting the science catch up and regulatory hurdles. Mike, you might want to comment as well. Yeah, first of all, Greg, I think you might have just planted a seed for a new business for those who are following today, trying to reverse engineer and store the information in one's DNA and cells. Um, you know, you I fully agree with everything that you said. It's, uh, it, it is worth, it's dependent on the therapeutics. Uh, again, there's no sense in generating the information but we're very fortunate in the sense that there are uh, the numbers as low as 500, but as many as 700. So between five to 700 compounds today are in phase one, phase two, or phase three trials, targeted compounds that are hitting over 140 different genomic alterations. And so there is a deep pipeline of targeted compounds going through clinical trials, and, and uh, you know, many of these will ultimately work their way through the, through the FDA. And that brings me to one of the great challenges uh, in terms of implementing, uh, implementing personalized medicine, really utilizing next generation sequencing broadly, and that's what's to do with the data. We know how to generate data. We do this very well. A number of groups do this very well for different disease states. But when you generate all this information, how do you turn it back? Let's go back to the actionable word. How do you take this information, associate it with the relative treatment options, and, and, and put it into a form in which not just the academic clinician, not just the academic medical uh, clinician can understand and act upon, but let's do it so, so we put it in a form that the community docs can act upon it. 80%, 80, 80 to 85% of our cancer patients in the United States are treated in community settings. They're not treated at the major cancer centers, as important as those cancer center, centers are. So a key piece that we have to overcome, and I think all of us on this panel are working through, you know, working through our own versions of this, is to take this very, very complex information, marry it up to something that, to, to, to make it actionable, and then translate it so the physician knows what to do when that patient walks into his or her office. Here's a great question, um, uh, and I'll throw this open to the panel. How can regulators hope to cope with personalized medicine when medicine has always been based on population-based studies with large control groups? Ashley? You're muted. I just took the mute off. Thanks. Um, so, so I think one of the things that regulators are encouraged by about personalized medicine is that they're motivated to get good therapeutics onto the market to the right patients to minimize 
exposures to patients who either won't respond or who are going to have a negative effect on that particular medication. And insofar as these different technologies can usher in that, um, that new time, um, it's something that regulators absolutely want to see, see happen. Um, what we need to do is um, figure out how the very rapidly expanding body of knowledge um, can be uh, sorted and interpreted uh, and matched uh, appropriately to the raw genetic data of individuals. And I think that um, I don't have the specific answer to that yet. I don't think anyone does except to say that um, we need to be having conversations all along the way um, on both sides so that the, um, the growth and the potential isn't hindered by um, inappropriate um, uh, hurdles being put in, in place, um, but appropriate regulation is, um, uh, is in place uh, at the same time. Great. Let's work our way through the panel. How about Amy? Thank you. I think that regulators at the FDA especially love personalized medicine and targeted therapeutics because it's a science-based enterprise and they love knowing why something is safe and effective for a particular group of people. So there is that embrace at the agency and over the past few years especially they've had a lot more experience with these products. So they're getting more comfortable with the science, they're getting more comfortable coordinating two completely different groups of people and regulatory paths, the drug people and the diagnostic test people. They're getting much better at that coordination. So I think uh, Dr. Polini mentioned the number of targeted therapies in the pipeline, and I think we're going to see those come up really quickly because of this comfort level and, frankly, excitement at the agency about personalized medicine. And we also heard some responses about how it's great to have these tools to identify biomarkers within a disease state, within a tumor, but we only have so many biomarkers and drug labels. And that is true, um, but I'm encouraged that drug labels get changed a variety of ways. Biomarker information gets in because the drug company does the research to support it, or because academics do the research to support it, or another organization does the research to support it. And I hope that that trend to um, update drug labels with biomarker information continues. Amber? Uh, uh -huh. So to expand on what Amy was saying, I do think it is going to be a paradigm shift in um, the way research might be done. Um, you know, there are there is focus on doing larger populations, and there might need to be a shift to focusing on smaller study populations and alternative clinical trial designs that can really focus on uh, identifying which individuals will benefit most from. Um, targeted therapies and also uh, which individuals might be most at risk for prediction of disease. And then uh, from a public policy standpoint, um, documenting what those subpopulations are and then educating all the healthcare providers on to how to um, target those, those subpopulations as well. So it is a large challenge. There is a, a going to be a, a deeper wealth of information involved in this, um, but I think that is the path we're on right now. And Dr. Polini. As Amy spoke about the FDA, I think she really hit it on the head. I mean, the, the FDA has been trying to get their arms around this, and they're in education mode right now. And I say that in a very positive way. They understand the importance of this approach. They understand the importance of utilizing next generation sequencing. They understand the importance of targeted therapeutics and cancer especially. And, uh, and it goes well beyond cancer. The nice thing about dealing with the FDA is that it's one body and even though there are different levels within that organization and it's a very complex organization they are in fact getting up to speed and they are I can tell you matter-of-factly they are thinking through ways to handle these issues the bigger challenge and maybe something that we can come back to at some point is the is is with the payers is with the insurance companies and who's going to pay because one of, the fund, one of the fundamental challenges, aside from the fact that this world is evolving very quickly, it's at least when you deal with the FDA, you deal with the FDA. And even though there are different departments there, it's, it is one governing body. 
When it comes to the payers, we deal with uh, CMS, and within CMS there are different Medicare administrators around the country, so education is on a region-by-region -region basis, as well as at a national level. And then there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of payers that we also have to educate around the United States. And it's just a much more complicated process, but I'll, I'll stop on that. But I, I thought, you know, the FDA is, is doing some great stuff right now. Yeah, the payer community, that's, a, that, that's a, a digital divide. How about, Greg, did you have any thoughts to close this one out? Yeah, I think uh, I agree with what Mike said on the, the FDA. Um, I think they are moving in a very positive way. They're trying to embrace this and um, get educated on it in a, in a positive way. Um, you know, you have to remember that they're looking at drugs, they're looking at food, they're looking at diagnostic tests, and these technologies impact all three. So in the case of, um, um, you know, food, if you're tracing back a salmonella contamination, you're probably using next-gen sequencing to do that. Um, in the case of pharma submissions, we're going to see, uh, as Mike was saying, more companion diagnostic submissions, which will include um, uh, companion, you know, the companion diagnostics may include uh, next-gen sequencing technology and the diagnostics themselves. So I do think that there's a fair amount um, that's going on in the agency, and I do think they're looking at it in a very positive way. So here's one for the group. What are the giant changes in personalized medicine that are just around the bend? Let's start with Dr. Polini. Well, let, let's start with, let me start with a question maybe back to the group. And we are all involved in, in health care. Uh, a number of us touch on cancer in particular and other, and other disease states. We get phone calls on a regular basis saying, I have a friend, I have a family member diagnosed with uh, disease X, Y, or Z. Can you help? And that's a very challenging question, even for those of us who are in this profession, because there's not one answer. We say, okay, we know, of a we know about a clinical trial. We can refer you to this key opinion leader. We can do this or do that. But it's a very, very complex question. We are not too far away from a world in which we can say, first stop, get the tumor sequence, have your blood drawn, and have sequencing performed. So we can understand the key molecular drivers of the cancer. That's starting to happen right now. And, and that, that complex question is going to be simplified over time. And then what we're going to see, and we're starting to see it today, and we started this process several years ago, is we will not only see a drug for a disease, but we'll see a cocktail of drugs targeting all the alterations. And so if you picture a cancer as, you know, as a car running down, going down a highway, and there's a block, okay? There's a drug that blocked the highway. They're stuck for a second. So what does that car do? It looks for an off-ramp. And then it goes down one off-ramp, and then eventually gets back on. And then we try to block the off-ramps. And so that process continues. So what we'll have to do is exactly what the world was able to do with HIV, and that is hit the disease with multiple therapeutics at the same time, block all the exit ramps, and so we can really contain that cancer for the long run. So those are the big challenges, but that's, uh, you know, I, I, think, um, I think it's very clear that that's the way that this is going to play out over the next several years, not even the next several decades, but the next several years. Can't resist a shout out to Jack Andraka, who's done some fabulous work there as well. Greg, do you have some thoughts? Yeah, I think it's, you know, I just wanted to build on what, what Mike is saying a little bit. And, you know, the, the way I look at it is if you look at HIV 20, 30 years ago, I mean, it was essentially a death sentence. Yeah. Uh, if somebody was diagnosed, um, there was little hope. And today you have people surviving for decades who are HIV positive. And that's largely due to good uh, uh, therapies available and, and good drug monitoring tools. And I see the same for cancer. I think cancer will become a chronic disease in, in the not-too-distant future. Uh, we'll generate a cocktail of drugs based on a molecular profile. Patients will get treated. They'll be monitored. You'll look at response to that therapy. The tumor will modify itself in response uh, you know, to the selection pressure of the drug throw off new mutations, a new cocktail will be established, and will knock down that, quote, viral load, just like with HIV. So I, I, I think that's, that's really in the not-too-distant future, and I think that's going to start happening very quickly based on the tools and therapies we have available and, and the, the big fat pipeline uh, that uh, pharma companies are investing in on the oncology space. 
so we're getting close to winding down this this chat. Uh, let's start with the uh, this question and work our way through the panel. Um, what is on the horizon of personalized medicine that has you most energized about the future of health? Let's start with uh, Amber. So I would say. Um not necessarily even something on the horizon, but something that's here right now. What has me most energized is the power of prevention. Um, so more, more so from drug treatment, but uh, looking at prevention and, and risk for disease and what someone can do to lower that risk or prevent that disease altogether. Uh, there are really two questions that patients come to uh, when they try to see genetic counts, uh, get genetic counseling, and those questions are what does this really mean for me and what does this mean for my kids and we can go on and on about what this means about risk for disease and what management but they really want to know how is it going to impact my life is it going to affect my quality of life am I going to be there for my family am I going to be alive for my children or am I worried for my children's health for the future and so when we have information that can prevent disease and put their minds at ease and truly empower patients that's what's most exciting for me Let's stay with the A's. Amy? I, I agree with Ashley, and I'd also like to add that I'm really excited about um, us knowing more about our own personal health care, and I am personally excited about the explosion of targeted therapies we are going to see, and not just because Mike's on the, uh, on the stage with me, but I love that tumor typing in cancer is going to become the standard of care very soon. My oh look, Ashley. <laughs> so, so there are four things to me. One is there's going to be an even greater explosion in um, useful genomic reference data. So increasingly predictive, comprehensive understanding of the interplay between genetics, environment, and health, and that'll be incalculably important to the success of personalized medicine. And there's some big initiatives that are have launched and are launching now that will really accelerate that. Um, secondly, we've talked a lot about tar targeted therapeutics, but um, I'm really excited about new technologies, epigenetic technologies, induced pluripotent stem cell technologies that will accelerate that. Um, third, consumerization of healthcare. Um, again, we talked about that already, but um, that's certainly um, exciting to me. Um, and the fourth thing that we haven't talked as much about are data mining, data analysis technologies that are being used in so many other fields that are now at last being brought into healthcare. So um, either on an individual level or on an institutional level, it's hard to know how to optimize your behaviors if you can't measure, if you can't observe and measure and score the, um, the, the benefit or um, you know, pros and cons of a particular behavior. So for um, increasingly in including biomarkers in therapeutic development that could enable that and then mining the, those hopefully massive data sets um, for individuals. And then for uh, large institutions, we see these data mining technologies being applied uh, as well. And that's something that um, it feels like healthcare has been a bit behind on, um, but is clearly coming of age as we speak and will only contribute um, to the acceleration of, of personalized medicine um, being available to, um, to everyone. Dr. Polini. Uh, I know we don't have much time, so uh, I'll keep it short. I think if anybody uh, participating or listening in spent a day with Amy, uh, Amber, Ashley, Greg, or me, you'd leave that day in a very optimistic mood. You'd have a very optimistic view of where we're going in this world, uh, in the world of medicine, because you know we we really do see we see these things at the cutting edge of what's happening, and um, I think in terms of the way Greg described it and others described it. Um, HIV is a great paradigm for what's about to happen in many, many other disease states, and um, and you know I for one, it's it's really fun working in this field because we get to see the change each and every day. And the Greg with two G's. Yeah. So um, uh, we have the unique vantage point of getting to have a large uh, research business. So we see a lot of what's going on in the research community, and it it really is energizing. Uh, these tools have provided a, a good technology base for people to do a lot of fascinating things. I think the broad areas that we'll see big change in uh, will be uh, genetic disease, particularly reproductive genetics. Um, we think cancer will probably be the big uh, opportunity in this space. Um, we also see 
uh, infectious disease and transplantation is being revolutionized by the technology. And I want to come back to something you mentioned from Eric Topol's book. So he was quoting Voltaire, and, and in Voltaire's time, the average life expectancy was about 43. So we're doing much better than that today, and uh, my hope is that since most of us will either die of heart disease or cancer, uh, that if we can solve some of these really critical issues, that we'll have a good, healthy life ahead of us. Ah, uh, yes, the perils of abundance. Well, I can see from the clock that our time is up. Obviously, we could talk quite a bit more about this subject. Our conversation from today will continue on TedMed.com on the Great Challenges page for the future of personalized medicine. Please share your reflections on today's dialogue and ask new questions after uh, this event there on Ted Med's Facebook page or on Twitter at hashtag Great Challenges. We welcome everyone's input. Thanks to all our team members who generously participated today and thanks to everybody in the Ted Med community who watched or sent questions. Finally, we want to say thank you again to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the sponsor of the Great Challenges program. So for this is Greg Masters saying bye now. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>